your Retro Columbia Pictures logo loses some street cred when a Sony company flashes on screen, since Sony didn't own the company until 1989. So, Rick, uh, explain to the audience exactly what it is a stunt double does. Join me next week on the set of The Dick Van Dyke Show. Wait, did this guy come all the way out here to ask Rick and Cliff one question about what a stuntman does? Damn, he's using the same font as Pulp Fiction. Why would anyone use the same font across several years of content? That is just lazy. Movie painstakingly spaces Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt's credits over the wrong people. And even if that's on purpose, what the f Brad Pitt eats and drinks a bunch of sh in a movie cliche. I'm pretty sure he's aware of the cliche, but it's a cliche nonetheless. My car's in the shop, and he gave me a ride. That's a big f***ing lie. Can we talk about the sudden narration in this movie? Because this shows up at the beginning like it's gonna be a thing, but is absent as f until Rick later goes to Italy. I'm just saying a conceit that's introduced then abandoned for most of the movie is jarring at best. I want to send you greetings from my wife, Mary Alice Schwarz. I knew they had a thing about pronouncing his name Schwarz or Schwartz, but what the f*** was that? Why did he have to say the full name? And why did he have to say it so Pacino-y? 35 millimeter prints of Tana and the 14 fists of McCluskey. And kids, if you don't know what 35 millimeter is, here's a cutaway to what 35 millimeter film looks like going through a projector. And that's it. The 14 fists of McCluskey cutaway is hilarious. And it's even sin removal worthy if you're ready for this protracted love letter to the 60s business. But it's over a minute dedicated to a fake movie. I'd love to see this movie. Love it, but I have to pick up my kids from band practice, and I don't think I'm gonna make it because of all these diversions. What's eating Snake Pliskin? And yet another diversion where we see the cold open of an episode of Bounty Law, complete with a fade to black and a retread of the opening credits of the show. And again, for film and TV historians, this shit is catnip to our retro sensibilities, but they should have called this movie 101 times indulgence. Then a couple of the jokers over in archival sent over a kinescope of a little treat featuring you. Jesus, all this just to tell Rick that he's a has been and that he needs to start making spaghetti westerns. I actually appreciate the deep shout outs to old Hollywood, but I also can't help but think that the movie is actively jacking off to an old memory. And I'm honestly not ready for the facial that's coming over the next couple hours. Dude, even in 1969, Los Angeles was really big. So the fact that Cliff runs into Pussycat more than once within a couple days is a training day level of a convenience. I'm always going to be the horse's ass that, that, that got bounty law canceled because I wanted some rinky dink movie career. Self expo deprecation. Movie shows Cliff driving around LA for 90 seconds, changing songs at different points in the journey. It's the Grand Theft Auto San Andreas 1969 portion of the movie. And of course, Cliff lives next to a drive in because God forbid we go three seconds in this movie without mentioning movies. There are other professions in Los Angeles, right? Like dryer repair, soda fountain service, typewriter maintenance. Hell, there are even people that do taxes and out there. By his own admission, Cliff is not a wealthy man. In fact, he's kind of hanging by a threat. So why the is he leaving all his lights on and his TV on while he's gone for the day and jacking up the electric bill. Don't. Movie recipes. I don't care how cinematically appealing it is, the fact that no one coming out of this neighborhood even briefly pauses before pulling out onto the main road is some bull White pants. I'm gonna tell you a story. Jesus, at least someone is finally interested in filling in some dialogue. I feel like I've been listening to the goddamn Forrest Gump soundtrack for the last 10 minutes. And he knows. As sure as God made little green apples. Damien Lewis is Michael Madsening so hard here that I see him in this character much more than I see Steve McQueen. You know how Eminem really leaned into his perceived flaws in the rap battle at the end of 8 Mile? That was self-awareness. The amount of footage footage in this movie, on the other hand, comes off more like self-parody. You met Sonia, makeup and hair. Hi. And this is Rebecca. Man, I like this movie, but there are so goddamn many people to keep up with it's getting distracting. Why do we even need an introduction of these super minor characters? This is like a goddamn early series Game of Thrones episode. The movie answers the question of showing how far Rick's house is from the studio lot by showing nearly the entirety of the f drive back. What goddamn meteorological anomaly occurred overnight last night? When Rick was kicking back in his pool, it looked like the weather was sublime, but a perfect storm blew in later just because it wanted to see Brad Pitt with his shirt off? Haha, -ha, Cliff likes to drink while he works, but given the amount of jumping around he's about to do, there's gonna be like two sips of this left in this open can before he gets to the roof. Yes, Brad Pitt looks amazing, and yes, I'm both jealous and thirsty right now, but also, why does Cliff have to take his shirt off to work on this antenna? If it's this hot, he should be removing his pants, too. This movie is so long, I'm gonna create an internal cliche and call it Margot Robbie is blissed out. Once upon a time in Hollywood, it's as much fun as Margot Robbie folding laundry, which, now that I've seen it, is kind of exciting, but whatever. Weird, this is a flashback, and present day is February 1969, so why the f 
is there a Tora 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 billboard when that movie didn't even come out until September of 1970? Even if filming started in 1968, they somehow mocked up some marketing materials for it. This is the set of The Green Hornet, which aired one season from 1966 to 1967. Is this movie's secret Rick Dalton exists effect taking place? If so, why is everything else virtually era perfect? And I work with my wife, and she believes it. She doesn't want his creepy ass around. Sounds like the honest reason for Randy's wife not working with Cliff is that she believes he killed his wife. And that's really all we need, right? So why do we get the extra reason of Cliff kicking Bruce Lee's ass necessitating a long flashback? Also, Cliff is currently on the roof at Rick's house, flashing back to a conversation that maybe he overheard outside of Rick's trailer. Or it's how he pieced this conversation together after Rick told him what happened. But now he's flashing back inside a flashback about the day he killed his wife? Man, it must be really hot on that roof right now. Natalie, my sister, said he's a loser. This scene pisses me off in so many ways. First off, this character is made to be so loathsome that I think the movie wants us to root for Cliff to kill her, furthering the problematic way women are portrayed overall in this film. Also, this cameo is so brief it puts Brad Pitt's in Deadpool 2 to shame. This is Rebecca Gayheart, man. Give her something to do other than briefly nag. You're a little man with a big mouth and a big chip. I'm not here to comment on the accuracy of Bruce Lee's portrayal here. What I am here to do is question why we need to see a legend insulted, and that insulter ultimately rewarded in the eyes of the viewer once Cliff beats his ass. Also, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Bruce Lee was an insecure, trash-talking asshole? Did Dragon the Bruce Lee story lie to me? F*** you, Rob Cohen. Now I have one, two, three, f more than ten reasons to hate you now. You know, Bruce, that guy's kind of famous. That guy? For what? He killed his wife and got away with it. Seeing as how this is a flashback, is this part of Cliff's fantasy, or did he overhear Bruce Lee and this guy whispering about this? Try that again. Notice the blue car in the background? Well, Cliff is about to walk over to a spot where that blue car is no longer behind him, but when Bruce Lee comes in for the attack, Cliff grabs him on his left side and in one quick motion somehow slings him over his right shoulder into that same blue car. This would require a 180 degree motion of some sort that Cliff definitely didn't do. Maybe it was all in his head, sure, but that means I need to send Cliff's brain. Also, the fact that Cliff can dodge a kick and chuck him into a car with brute strength makes sense, but the fact that he could go toe to toe with Bruce Lee using martial arts for more than two seconds is goddamn laughable. If the gate was wide open at the Tate House, why did Manson park all the way down here? Man. I don't care what happens at the end of the movie. Seeing Manson actually meet Sharon Tate makes me want to take a shower with one of those heads they use to clean the circus elephants. Littering. When we're on set, I prefer to only be referred to by my character's name. Eight-year-old method actors. What do you read? It's a biography in Walt Disney. Oh, really? Is that what your character Marabella would be doing? 11-year-old Daniel Day-Lewis is not amused. This story is currently set in early February 1969, but Pendulum did not come out in the U.S. until March. Was it true you almost got the McQueen part in The Great Escape? The movie castrobates by putting Leonardo DiCaprio into The Great Escape, completely erasing Steve McQueen. And while it's fun, anything that gives a Hollywood producer an idea about remaking a movie in some way that's against God has got to be a sin, right? Although, even if they seamlessly put DiCaprio in this movie, there's still something just a bit off about it. Why don't you stand over by the poster so people will know who you are? I could say this many times, but movie has time for this. It has so much time for this. Oh. <laughs> watching Sharon Tate enjoy watching her movie with a crowd is one of the biggest delights of this movie. We're moving us in. I've got a question though. If you can erase Steve McQueen and put Leonardo DiCaprio in The Great Escape, why can't you do the same with Margot Robbie here? Sure, it might be completely disrespectful to Sharon Tate, but these two actresses don't look a bit alike. And consistency is better than respect, right? <laughs> right? God damn it, get your foot fetish out of the way, Quentin. For nearly six minutes, we watched this entire TV episode play out, fully edited. Line. Then we see Rick starting to flub his lines, which leads to an epic meltdown in his trailer, which leads to him being awesome for the rest of the filming. But did we really need to see all that? Look, I'd watch Quentin film the phone book, but Jesus. I'm aware that old TV shows used to do this all the time, but why are these two assholes about to duel again? We've never even f***ing met, but they're both cool with dying right now? Who's paying you around here? I hope you... Huh. And what have you heard about me? I heard about the Lancer Ranch. This show is far too good to be of its time. Look, I'm kind of old and I had grandparents with TVs when I was a kid, and I watched a lot of this type of stuff. And let me tell you, the actors in those shows talk like they were either from lower Alabama or mid-Atlantic, and almost no one was 10% as authentic and emotional as either of these actors. Hell, even the businessman that got killed was pretty f***ing good. Your brains are gonna be splattered all over your goddamn pool. I'd call this an empty threat, considering Rick is threatening the one part of the mirror in which his reflection wouldn't be visible. If anything, he's warning the trailer door. We now take you to an entirely new portion of this motion picture, driving. Chadsworth, you hitch up and down 
around Burbank Boulevard all day till someone says they'll drive you to Chatsworth. A solid percentage of this movie would feel right at home in a Californian sketch on SNL. It's at this point that Margaret Qualley's ass has become officially distracting, and I can only send the movie for making me have that thought. The ranch. God damn it. Want me to stop your while driving? How old are you? Oh, sure, this is played off as cute in the movie, but take it from me. Do not say this to your Uber driver unless you really mean it. Give me evil sexy Hamlet. This is a fantastic sequence, but what does it mean? This is framed as one of his ultimate achievements, but when Rick goes on to make spaghetti westerns after this, it's based on his performance on the show FBI. Not this pilot. I got pads on. <laughs> and I always throw myself on the floor, just for fun, even when I'm not getting paid. <laughs> I don't think these scenes need to be so long, but this scene is great. DiCaprio is giving his all as Rick Dalton, giving his all, and Julia Butters is terrific. That's a car. You heard a f***ing car inside here? When Snake does eventually look outside, it's super far away, and it'll have been 16 seconds after Squeaky told her to check it out. That means that car was super, super, duper far away when they heard it. Some old looking dude in a Hawaiian shirt who just gave Pussycat a ride home. Okay, I'll buy that she can make out the Hawaiian shirt and ascertain he drove Pussycat home, but does Cliff look old by any stretch of the imagination from this f***ing distance? Here's the problem with this entire sequence. It's awesome and full of great tension, but it ultimately means nothing to the whole story. Sure, Tex and his posse need an introduction, but it only serves to put a face to a name when they get their asses killed to hell. This is the gold watch section of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Ever been to Houston? Of course I have. Yeah, I spent two weeks once on a Houston chain gang. But when you were turning down BJ's from Pussycat, you said, Prison tried to get me all my life, but ain't got me yet. Now, it was commendable of you to turn down the BJ, but to lie about your prison time? That's f***ed up. So, we got Harley Quinn Smith in this movie, and the actress who plays Harley Quinn in the current DCEU. I don't know if it's a sin, and I don't even know if it's worth mentioning, but I'm shooting now, and asking questions... I... No, I guess. Why can't I see him right now? Because he's napping. This is his nap time. The main reason why this scene plays so tense is because everybody acts way more suspicious than they should or would. We know this is the ranch where Charles Manson and his killers live, and we know that George Spawn is a prime candidate to be dead right now. But there is no reason why everybody tries to prevent Cliff from seeing him other than to make this scene tense. Holy f I think Tarantino literally blew his wand on his foot thing in this movie. This movie has more propped up feet in it than a multitasking gynecologist's office. How do you know George? I used to shoot westerns here at the ranch. So despite what I said earlier, this scene does deserve a sin removal. It's tense because we know Cliff Booth isn't a real person and could easily be someone the Manson family killed. He's deep in their lair, talking to squeaky f***ing from. And Tarantino started this scene with the camera level and now we've got these wicked angles that contribute to our unease. We're certain he's either dead or going to have to fight his way off this ranch, so I will duly remove a sin for the great filmmaking. Door at the end of the hallway. Man, a woman in this movie can't even be flippant without using her feet for some purpose. This was a mistake! You should leave! I really wish Pussycat had said this about eight minutes ago. <laughs> movie is secretly a sequel to Snatch, only Brad Pitt retired the weird gypsy Irish accent. These characters live in a parallel universe where the not-real Rick Dalton stars in real TV shows and not-real TV shows and movies. One here is Jigsaw Jane, in which Tarantino imagines Suzanne Plachette as the title character. But, much like the effects of time travel, it's hard to believe the very real movies that exist in this universe would be the same movies, or that the mere presence of Rick Dalton wouldn't change way more in this universe than it already does. <laughs> That's DiCaprio playing Burt Reynolds. <laughs> this episode, All the Streets Are Silent, aired in 1965, though. Is this the Rick Dalton effect taking place in this timeline? The episode they made in our universe came out four years earlier, but Dalton's mere presence somehow made them film it four years later just without Burt Reynolds? After that Musso and Frank's lunch meeting... God damn it, we've only had one instance of narration before this. Where is this coming from? Vanilla Sky? Tax support! And his fourth... God damn, Rick did four movies in six months while in Italy? Who the f*** does he think he is? Eric Roberts? Oh my Whoa, did this movie just sin itself? I think the movie just sinned itself. For some reason. An arrow and a ding, I'll take it. People who do this. Brad Pitt couldn't be more Tyler Durden in this scene if he asked his seatmate whether to give the flight attendant the ass or the crotch. Rick was really not sure about what lay ahead for him. Catch Inception if you aviate her on Wall Street. Movie very strangely updates us on what Bruce Lee is doing right now. Around 10, Sharon and her friends left El Coyote and arrived back at her house. I mean, I love Kurt Russell. I want to see him in nearly everything. But this narration is incredibly unhelpful. Imagine if the time sequence scenes from Jackie Brown had some actor's minor character narrating it, like, I don't know, Chris Tucker. We'd be super annoyed. Around midnight, a completely drunk Rick Dalton started making a blender of frozen margaritas. Here's the problem with the last part of the movie. Have you ever been this drunk? I've been this drunk, and there's no f***ing way any of the ensuing events would occur without anyone falling on their asses. And that's before Cliff starts tripping balls. Look, Chief, you don't belong here. Now take this mechanical asshole and get it off my... 
street! Rick is making way more noise than the car ever was. And it's insane that no one in this affluent neighborhood calls the cops or wonders what's going on. What did Charlie say? He said, go to Terry's old house and kill everybody in there. And Glorious Bastards was all about killing Nazis, so the revisionist history worked on an emotional level. But this movie's been all about Rick and Cliff's bromance. How the latter got away with killing his wife and the former learning to act again. I'm just saying, this revisionist history, while satisfying, seems less than Eric. Was that Rick Dalton? Oh, come on. You didn't know that was Rick Dalton. Give me a break. He doesn't look a thing like the guy in Bounty Law anymore, and you saw him in low light, but this is going to change the course of the Manson murders. I can't believe that asshole in the robe was Jake Cahill. When I was a kid, I had a Bounty Law lunchbox. The movie wants you to believe that everyone, even evil murdering buttholes, cream their pants whenever they see a vintage celebrity. What do we do now? Well, we do what we came to do. And when we're done, we split up and hitch home. Look, I'm not about to get into the minds of psychotic killers who are probably on serious drugs, but without a car, this murder spree just instantly got more difficult. You guys really think you can f***ing hitchhike back home at this hour? With blood on your clothes, probably? Just a minute ago, they were worried that too many people on the block were awake and alert. Now they're acting like nothing is a consideration anymore. Okay, pig killers. Let's kill some piggies. It's almost verbatim what George Clooney said to his crew before they attacked the vampires in the Tarantino pen from Dust Till Dawn. I like this movie overall, but it sure does feel like a f***ing greatest hits album. And don't you move. <laughs> this is the perfect encapsulation of that moment. Want to hear a sin about dog food? Good. The whole plan they made on the plane back from Italy, which they took today, was for Rick and Cliff to get drunk and celebrate nine years working together and then part ways. My question is, why does Cliff have dog food at Rick's house? Yes, he brought the dog over to protect Rick's wife while they were away. But was he planning on staying overnight? If the idea was to get blackout drunk, I can see that. But then I can't understand why they took the Cadillac to the restaurant only to take a taxi back. Nothing about this movie suggests that Cliff ever takes his dog out of the trailer to spend time with Rick, and he has a very specific feeding routine that includes mounds of dry dog food on top of the wet dog food, which... He doesn't have here. My point is, I think the movie just wanted to have a dog kicks ass scene, and this is how it's resolved in the script. This entrance to this door. This insane ending is basically Tarantino remaking the end of Inglorious Bastards. Here's some shit that didn't happen. Wish fulfillment fanfic for the masses. Told with a little bit of the old ultra violence. And oh yeah, here's Rick using his flamethrower from that Nazi movie he shot, which was like discount Inglorious Bastards. While Katie may deserve it, Cliff slams her head like a hundred times in very gratuitous fashion, and it's like, dude, now you're making me feel sorry for a Manson family killer. Once upon a time in Looney Tunes. Oh, sure, he couldn't hear anything else that was going on, including gunshots, but someone smashing through a window gets his attention. Also, characters wearing headphones that doesn't hear all the crazy sh close by cliche. This flamethrower is instantly operational, despite not being used since Rick filmed that movie several years ago. Good friend, Cliff. I tried. Hey, remember when this character killed his wife in cold blood on a boat because she was being mean? So no one gathered around the crime scene in this secluded neighborhood? I know Jay and Sharon are about to come out, but this is ages after the actual events happened. Jay, honey, is everything all right? I don't know. Somehow this ending makes it more tragic that Sharon Tate died. The what-if scenario where she and her four friends are still alive and the Manson family is just a footnote in history is oddly effective, informing us of how sad the real event was. Tate might end up taking roles that other actors don't get, changing the entire landscape for films for the 70s. So many things change! Anyway, here's the cinema. Speaking on behalf of Red Apple Cigarettes. Tarantino baiting. FBI tonight, and I watch it with Squeaky. She gets all pissed off if I fall asleep. Johnny Madrid. Why, Johnny Ringo, you look like somebody just walked over your grave. Who? I got it. My warriors who will not hang up the phone until their client either buys or f***ing dies! I need to see something official that verifies that you're 18, which you don't have. Because you're not. I've sat at those kitchen tables with you and listened to you tell those parents. When I know, I know. And you don't. You don't. It smells like they're cooking a goddamn cat over there. I want to send you greetings from my wife, 
Mary Alice Schwartz, Harriet, and blah blah Nyborg. He was once somebody's baby boy, and he had a mother and a father who loved him. This went from six to midnight. Ding, 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 ding. But you're laughing at what I'm saying, but I'm not saying anything funny. So what do you think is so funny? I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown. I amuse you. Jimmy, Jimmy, she ain't gonna leave. Go. Us. Fucking Jimmy me, Jules! Uh, hi. I want six tickets to Asses of Fire. This movie might not be appropriate for your little ones. <laughs>